Let's talk a little bit about that. Like I said, we've got these GPS devices now that we can stick on all kinds of things. This is a Mongolian gazelle in the eastern steppe of Mongolia. Um, I hear that Ricardo has made the gazelle a famous, uh, famous animal around here now with his uh, recent success with the PRL paper. So this is what they look like when you got a, a movement collar on them. It's, uh, it's not trivial to go out in the middle of nowhere, hundreds of kilometers from civilization, and catch these things and stick a collar on them. So we have a limited number of animals with these. I'll talk more about the gazelles later. Um, but we are getting data on lots of new species in lots of different places, and it allows us to look at movement on an unprecedented scale. But the problem that's introduced now with this classical movement paradigm is that now data collection is no longer limited to direct observation or methods where you need to be somewhat close to the animal and where you can maybe relate changes in direction to some kind of behavior. Like in the butterfly example, the butterfly goes from plant to plant, it stops at each plant, and makes a decision about where to go next. I buy that as a sensible way to think about butterfly movement. But when you stick in a collar on an animal like a gazelle, you make a decision when you stick the collar on about how to collect the data. You program it to say, collect data every 15 minutes or every two days or whatever. So you impose some kind of sampling rate on it that's essentially arbitrary relative to the movement. It's usually determined more by how long you want the collar to last. You, you only have finite battery life. But every relocation you take burns up battery. So how long do you want the collar to last and how much detail do you want in the data? has absolutely nothing to do with the underlying movement process. So now, you've got this situation where we've got this arbitrary sampling of location fixes from some animal, usually at some regular time interval, but often at irregular time intervals, which makes everything worse and harder. Um, but then you just take the paths that you get from, from that and connect the dots, and then assume that that makes some kind of sense and plug that into those correlated random walk models just like you did before with butterflies where you follow them from plant to plant. Okay, but now you've imposed a, a, essentially a time scale on the process, the sampling rate that you chose to sample at. Whether or not that has anything to do with the process and its characteristic time scales, you usually have no idea. And that mismatch between, between time scales, which in my opinion happens almost as a rule, uh, ends up causing problems. You get very biased estimates of parameters. You can get completely wrong answers about the underlying process when you impose a time scale on it by sampling at a rate that's nothing near the process time scale. And of course, with the composite model, this gets worse because they have multiple process time scales, usually different because you're interested in different movement operating on different uh, spatial and temporal scales. Okay, so. To look at this visually, say that you have the same path and the same underlying process, and you just sample it in a different way, okay? And then connect the dots. You get very different representations of the path. And you can show um, that what you, what you uh, the resulting step length and turn angle distributions that you would derive from that discretization of the path depend very heavily on the discretization and not uh, not so much on the process, not as much on the process as you would like. Okay, again, you need this matching of time scales to get a, a reasonable answer, but you, typically you have no way to check a priori. And you know so little about the movement of so many animals that we don't even know how to guess that most of the time. And of course, it gets worse for the composite models, because now even if you guess right and get one of the time scales, you're almost certain to miss the others. Uh, there's no way you can be correct with all of them. And uh, another thing that has to do with sampling, and this is a, a key uh, misconception, I think, among ecologists, is that ecologists worry about issues like oversampling the path, like hey, having too much resolution in the data, because then the uh, location, subsequent locations are highly correlated with each other. And ecologists typically learn statistical methods that assume independently and identically distributed observations, and the correlation breaks those assumptions, causes problems. So ecologists say, no, 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 you don't want too much data, you don't want too, too much correlation. But as I'm going to talk about in a minute, if you think about this from a stochastic process perspective, that correlation in the data is what you want to know. That is the, the most interesting thing you can pull out of that path. And uh, ecologists often do crazy things like thinning the data to get rid of the, to destroy the autocorrelation structure in it. 
and then say, aha, now we have independent observations, now let's analyze those. Absolutely uh, makes no sense. Okay, so if you want to identify multiple movement behaviors in the same path, these composite correlated random walk models are the only game in town right now, really. But they have other issues, too. You need a ton of data. You need really long time series, lots of observations, very clean uh, data. They're very fragile statistically. They break down if you have messy data, noisy data, data with irregular gaps in them. Uh, these things can break down completely. And uh, if you have gaps in the data, which often occurs, Emilio and I talked yesterday about gappy movement data and what to do about it, um, you can miss small scale processes. So any process that has a time scale that is uh, less than that of the, the length of the typical gap in the data will just disappear. You won't see it in the data at all. So this is a, these are results of a composite random walk analysis of the gazelle um, done by a master student of mine last year. The idea is to try to assign uh, two different movement states to the paths. So black is one and red is the other. Um, and we had 36 animals, and the statistics and all that only worked for two out of 36 animals and gave complete nonsense answers on those two that actually did produce some results. The others, the, the models just never converged. So out of this data set, we, we essentially got nothing out of that analysis using these currently uh, popular techniques. And that really made me wonder, um, can we do better? How can we, how can we go beyond that? Okay, so with that backdrop, I want to introduce the project. Um, this is funded by the, the U.S. National Science Foundation, uh, the Bioinformatics Panel. So that means it starts with data. Informatics is the, the science of managing, organizing, understanding, analyzing, modeling data. Um, we compile data on a bunch of different species that include, that include all kinds of different movement behaviors, different uh, uh, monitoring technologies that introduce different error structures, different questions we want to ask. So we have gazelle, whooping cranes, black tip sharks, uh, coulon, so on and so forth, and many others. The gazelle are going to be the flagship example. And then we're doing different things. The project, uh, as I see it, has three main branches. Of course, there's a lot of overlap between them. One is uh, group movements, coordination of movement among individuals, and effects of non-local information on movement. That's the branch that Ricardo and uh, Stovall recently contributed to with the uh, Gazelle Calling paper, now in PRL. Um, another that is, gets at these things I was just talking about, identifying the fundamental statistics of movement, what drives animal movement, how animals make decisions about movement, and linking movement models and data together in a rigorous way to sort those things out. That's what I'm going to talk about now. Um, and then another that looks at uh, how movement changes when individuals learn as they age. Um, how that changes their movement behavior and possibly their social interactions and social dynamics. That I'm not going to talk about at all. Okay, so our overall approach was to take, kind of take a step back from what people were doing in the ecological literature and say, all right, let's look around here. Okay, we know mo movement is a stochastic process. We know it's probably not a good idea to use these discrete step models to, to, to represent it. Okay, so who does a lot of continuous stochastic process modeling? Well, the physicists do that. All right, so we need to collaborate with physicists. Um, but how do you connect those models to data? Well, the geostatisticians do that for spatial field, for random spatial fields. They develop very sophisticated methods for uh, connecting these kinds of stochastic process models to data. So we need to borrow some of that. Statisticians have a time series analysis that also deals with time autocorrelated uh, processes. Yes. Yes. Uh, you insist on uh, that the movement is stochastic. But I mean, but I, I'm not sure. I mean, how far is your understanding? For example, you look into ants; they don't move stochastically. If you see seasonal uh, mobility of elephants, it's not random, so it's not stochastic. Yeah, yeah. So I wonder, I mean, it's not. I don't expect that a gazelle moves randomly, right? It probably has some memory about where food is more frequent. Right. So. I mean, of course, there is always some randomness, right? Even ourselves, we move, right. we have some uh, random component. But I don't know what is the balance between this randomness and this. Uh, I think the, the, that that is the key question uh, when you're when you're doing this. What is the balance between the stochastic part and something that's driven or imposed or you know follows some gradient in the environment or something like that? And I'm not claiming that. Um, 
that you should ignore those things. I mean, ultimately, that's where this is going. But you need some kind of stochastic framework to work in and to be able to, to, to partition out what's just random noise and what's directed or driven movement. And that's that's where we're we're going with this. So this is just sort of establishing. See, the, the, the stochastic process framework also helps you make the, the connection to the data via the statistic. Because then you look at the probability distribution of the process given the, the mechanism you think is happening and ask how likely are the data then under that that, uh, that process. That's that's what allows you to make that. But you can build in deterministic relationships into that too. So. Okay, so as, a, as an overall framework, we're viewing movement as a continuous stochastic process, specifically a Gaussian process that is observed at discrete times. We don't assume, we don't necessarily assume that the process is Markovian. Sometimes there can be, very often you see long, uh, long-term persistent correlations in movement data, dependence on the movement path uh, up to uh, the entire path up to the current point in time. And that, we've had some discussion about, is maybe a way to get at things like spatial memory, where you have these long-term persistent uh, autocorrelations. OK, from that perspective, uh, statistically, you want to focus on the, on the fundamental statistics of the process. For the Gaussian process, it's entirely characterized by its first two cumulants, the time-dependent mean and autocorrelation functions. Um, so, so that alone uh, switches the focus from a lot of the things that ecologists have worried about. Suddenly, autocorrelation is not your enemy. It's not something evil. It's one of the more informative things you can actually measure from the data. Um, and for many ecologically relevant movement processes, you don't see time, time dependence in the mean. Of course, for something like migration, you will, but for non-migratory species, a lot of the time, the mean is stationary, and you can focus only on the autocorrelation, which allows you to get at these long-term persistent correlations in the data. Okay, and the autocorrelation function, or its, or its close relatives, the semivariance function or spectral density function, then become the, uh, the vehicles by which you connect the models to the data. Okay. And the nice thing is, compared to current methods, this you don't have to worry about an a priori choice of the time scale uh, being your sampling rate that you imposed on the data. You use all possible time scales in the data. You calculate these quantities for all possible time lags in the data set. And so you effectively, within certain limits, let the data tell you what the relevant time scale of movement are. Okay. So the overall approach like, is like this. You look at the autocorrelation structure of the data. That's the focus. There are basically three ways you can get at that in a robust statistical way. One is via the semivariance function and its empirical estimate of the variogram. The other is probably what you guys would, would do first, would be look at the spectral density function via the periodogram. Those are non-parametric methods. They don't assume any particular model of movement or autocorrelation structure. But if you are willing to make an assumption about the movement model, the process model, then you can use maximum likelihood, which conditions on the probability distribution of the process under that model, and ask how likely are the data to have come from that, uh, that process. OK, if you can quantify these things, then you can start to get at a huge range of very useful quantities for, uh, that, that ecologists want to know. You can identify cycles and periodicities, repeating behaviors in the movement. You can say something about the animal's behavioral state and uh, which kinds of movement behavior it exhibits when. The uh, characteristic spatial and temporal scales of movement or multiple characteristic spatial and temporal scales in the movement. You can do forecasting and interpolation. You can predict where it was when you didn't see it and put uh, some kind of uncertainty statement around that prediction. You can estimate the animal's home range or space usage, which is a key quantity in conservation biology. You can estimate movement speed, path length all kinds of useful, interesting things. All of that depends on knowing the autocorrelation structure of the data. But of course, nothing's free. Um, these methods, there, there are strong trade-offs among these different approaches um, in terms of their statistical behavior. Um, the variogram is fairly robust, and it's fairly easy to implement, but it gives biased estimates, and uh, it, its confidence intervals are unreliable. The periodogram. It's very efficient, uh, but it's very fragile. Your data get ugly, it breaks down very quickly. Uh, this was actually the first thing we tried with the Gazelle data, it didn't work at all. Um, and maximum likelihood, conditioning on the probability distribution of the process, is, uh, is the best overall in terms of its performance, but it comes at huge computational cost uh, on the order of n cubed. And for many uh, larger data sets, it's just not computationally feasible. 
So you sort of have to pick your poison. Um, for some problems, you can use these things in parallel. What we're trying with the gazelle is start with the variogram because it's easy, relatively easy and robust. Get an idea of what kind of movement models might characterize the data. Get better estimates of those via maximum likelihood and then use a modified uh, version of the periodogram to get at repeating behaviors that might act on top of these other processes. Okay, I'm going to introduce the gazelle now. So we are in Asia, uh, near China and Russia. Uh, the eastern steppes of Mongolia is this kind of shaded region here. This is often referred to as the world's largest remaining grassland. Uh, no scale here, hundreds of kilometers. It's a huge area of uh, essentially not quite flat, but slowly rolling hills. Uh, it looks like that. Uh, it's just vast. And interesting thing here, even in this one shot, you can see there's a lot of variability in the vegetation. Here it's kind of browned out and dead. Here it's green. Here it's different stage of growth. Over there it's green again. This is typical. And we think this is important in the way that gazelles move. So it's a dry environment. There's not much rain. The grass has trouble growing. Only grows when you get localized, intense rainfall events. They are spatially and temporally unpredictable. You can come to the same piece of ground this time of year this year and find it covered in nice green grass. Come back two weeks later, it's brown and dead. Come back the same time next year, there's something completely different going on. So the gazelles typically have to move huge distances to find the food they need. There's very little predictability. Spatial memory probably plays little role in the system because there's nothing on which to base it. Um, we have long, we can measure the, the grass quality from satellite data and look at uh, the predictability and variability of it. And we find there's very little consistency uh, among years or times. Okay, this is the critter. Uh, Estimated to be about a million of those guys out there. They live in herds sometimes. Sometimes they move individually. Herds seem to be very fluid things. Individuals kind of come and go as they want. They're not cohesive. Sometimes you find them uh, all by themselves. Sometimes you find a quarter of a million of them together at the same place. Um, with Ricardo's work, we showed that perhaps vocal communication among them might be an uh, important, important component to how they navigate and move and find resources. Uh, they, they make a lot of noise when they're walking around. Uh, these uh, the pictures in this movie I'm going to show, by the way, are due to Thomas Mueller, one of our uh, project partners. OK, so we have data on 36 animals over uh, about a five-year period. I'm going to show uh, animation here of just five of them that were captured in cholera in the same place at the same time, September 2007. And just to give you a sense of how they, the scales of their movement. Now, these, these guys were captured in the same herd you know, on the same day, collared and released. And what, what you'll notice when I play the movie is that it, it, this cluster of them kind of explodes. They all just kind of go different ways. Um, oops, that's the wrong way. So there they go. Okay, so again, notice the scale of the movement. This is like hundreds of kilometers, often with them going back and forth and all around. You can see here, this is the, the border uh, with China here, and you can, it's fenced, uh, and the gazelle can't move through that. So you, you can see they kind of bounce off the fence sometimes. This guy didn't actually go through the fence. We just saw him here, and then he probably went around and we got him over there. But, um, you know, from an evolutionary perspective, as a rule, if you're an animal, it pays to be lazy as much as you can get away with. Right? There's no reason to be moving hundreds of kilometers back and forth if you don't need to be moving that much. It burns up an awful lot of energy, exposes you to predators and all kinds of risk. So we think that this, you know, this kind of huge movement that we see is a product of the environment that they live in and the fact that they've just got to move a lot to find the food that they need to survive. Um, interestingly, uh, humans in this same environment end up being nomads as well, having to move around constantly to keep their livestock alive can't just establish in one place and make a living too dry, not enough vegetation. Okay, so this is probably the only slide of this most of you will be interested in, I'm sorry about that, but trying to uh, make the point about the connection between models and data. These are the actual movement models we're gonna consider. Um, so we wanted to start from the point, point of view that said, okay, let's start with the simplest possible thing we can assume, Brownian motion. 
um, almost certainly won't work, but let's just start there. And let's only go as complex as we need to go to pick up all the important features in the movement. This is very different from how ecologists usually work, in that they think, OK, this, 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 and this, and this have got to be in there, because I know these things are important. So let's build a big, complicated model that has all this stuff in there, lots of moving parts, and then start with that. And you end up with this intractable thing you can't analyze and you can't really understand. It's a black box. We're doing this the other way around and say starting with well-established, well-known, very simple models and only going until we hit the point where we can say, now we can characterize the movement and let's make sure we understand how that works. Okay, so we, we express the models in terms of their semi-variance functions because we're going to use a variogram, the empirical estimator of that, to connect the models to data. So for Brownian motion, it's just linear in the time like tau with diffusion coefficient d. You can generalize that one step uh, to anomalous diffusion where there's some scaling exponent for alpha less than one. You have subdiffusion, alpha equal to one gives you classical Brownian motion, alpha greater than one is super diffusion. Um, one, you can go another step farther and say, okay, maybe it's something like Ornstein Uhlenbeck motion. Um, in my opinion, this is probably the simplest movement model that will apply to animal movement data. You have Brownian motion with a central tendency. So there's some location around which you're centered. You move around in a Brownian way but with a tendency to come back to that location. The scale of the area over which the animal range, the home range variance is sigma h, and the time scale over which the animal crosses its home range is tau h. Okay, so that's what we started with. I'm, I'm presenting this like we had these four models from the beginning, but really what we had were three models, uh, and we see how far we can get with those. Turns out none of them work very well. We had to develop a fourth model. I'm sorry. Yep. Can you remind what is the semivariance function? The semivariance is just the 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 um, it's the squared distance between observations separated by a time lag of tau as a function of time lag. So it's the variance in the distance between observations separated by time lag. Okay, so there was something that was missing uh, with these three models. We reasoned that that was something like a foraging behavior, which for an animal like a gazelle, a uh, grazing animal, they put their head down and they kind of walk in a straight line way. So that suggests an, a, a linear ballistic-like motion that was missing from the model. So we generalized the OU process to include uh, random periods of super diffusion, uh, ballistic-like motion that have a characteristic time scale of tau f. So we've introduced another parameter, and we get a slightly more complicated uh, similar variance function. So those are the models. Um, the way you do this, uh, the, the geostats folks have a lot of methods for estimating semi-variance from data. None of those methods work well for gap data. The field guys that worked with the gazelles made some decisions trying to balance that trade-off between uh, the detail in the data and how long the collars would last. So they did, uh, they, they said, well, let's take short bursts of fine scale observations, like say an hour or half an hour, and then turn the collars off for 10 days after that. So we'll do that for two days, a couple days, turn the collars off for 10 days, and turn them back on again. And then let's vary that fine sampling rate between different animals. So some have one hour time scale at fine. Uh, fine resolution size, some are 5, some are 25. So now when you put this all together, you have all kinds of different time uh, sampling resolutions in the data with huge irregular or huge uh, regular gaps of 10 days with nothing. And that caused all statistical standard statistical methods that we could find to fail completely and totally and utterly. Nothing worked. So we had to develop new methods, um, the, the easiest of which is this weighted variogram estimator. Um, and this is just the squared uh, distance between positions at time ti and time tj, where ti minus tj is the time like tau. And with weights given by this weighting scheme that effectively just says, if you have a time t1 and a time t2, and you've got a burst of sampling around those two times, when you, when you compute the, the semivariance, you're going to have a bunch of essentially identical estimates of it because these things are all close together in time. So uh, semivariances calculated at that time like tau are going to be sort of oversampled in the sense that your estimates will be biased towards those particular times in the data. And this sampling scheme says, no, 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 really it's not like there are 20 
points there. It's more like one effective pair of points. So it just downweights those. And that works. Um, so we can look at the data and first make sure you know, the assumptions we made about the process are reasonable. We assumed a Gaussian process. So if you compute the velocities of all animals and mean shift them, or uh, well, they're, they shift themselves to zero because they're velocities. Sorry about that. Um, and overlay them on the same axis, you can see it's roughly Gaussian. Um, not, too, not too bad. And then uh, mean estimates in the x and uh, y directions for the velocity are all with an error of zero uh, with no apparent time trend in the means. So that justifies our focus on a Gaussian process and ignoring the first moment, the time dependent mean, focusing only on the second, uh, the second moment or the second cumulant, the other correlation function. Okay, so here's semi-variance versus time lag. Uh, the blue points are, are from uh, the data, the estimates of the semi-variance averaged across all 36 animals. The bars are 95% confidence intervals. And then we fit each of these four models. This is Brownian motion, anomalous diffusion, the OU process, and what we're calling the OUF process, our generalization of it, to the data via uh, weighted least squares regression that accounts for the, the different uh, precision in these estimates. And this is what we get. So the OUF process looks like it's consistent with the data. These other three, not so much. Does anything look weird to you here, though? There's the periodic peaks. Uh... Well, yeah, there's a lot of noise. And that's, some of that is due to the gapping, where there's certain time lines where you don't have very many observations to average over. So you get very bad estimates of those. You have this semi variance going to 10,000. It's nearly periodic. Is this something? There, there, well, we, I'm not going to show it, but we do have results for uh, a, a robust oops, modi okay. that what I wanted to do. Uh, modified version of the periodogram. And it looks like there are periodicities on the scale of about a day, but not, not longer. So, and we're still trying to figure out what, what those mean in ecological terms. We don't have a good idea yet. It's not, it's not resting behavior. It's not uh, you know, differences in diurnal behavior. There's some kind of back and forth motion that we don't quite understand. What I was getting at, though, is that if you, if you plot the semivariance function of the OU process, it, it should look like this. It's a saturating function. It starts initially Brownian, initially linear in, in tau, and then it saturates to an asymptote, which is the, the home range variance the sigma sub h. But when you fit it to this, you get something that doesn't look at all like the data. And why is that? Um, why didn't that work? Uh, if you zoom in to the small lag end of the, the variogram, notice here it goes out to a couple hundred days. Here we're just focusing on a couple of days. Uh, you see the answer. Initially, there is this upward curvature um, at very short lags that is inconsistent with the OU process. But these points here, these estimates here, have super tiny confidence intervals because they're the best estimates in the entire variogram. When you calculate this, you're averaging over pairs of observations separated by time like tau. For small tau, you have more, many more pairs of observations, so you get the best estimates of that quantity. For tau equals the length of your time series, you have only one pair of observations and you get an estimate that has errors as big as the estimate. So this is a visually kind of tiny feature, but statistically it is by far the strongest, most supported thing in the data. And the OU process is initially linear and then saturates. It cannot account for this curvature. This upward curvature is indicated, indicative of uh, super diffusion or ballistic-like mo motion at very short time lags, tau, on the order of less than a day. And only this new OUF process uh, can, do, can do this super diffusion at short lags, regular diffusion at intermediate lags, and kind of asymptotic diffusion at longer lags. OK, the pro this process, the OUF process, has two time scales. The foraging time scale, which is on the order, we estimate to be on the order of about 10 hours, and the home range time scale, uh, which is on the order of about two months. OK. What? I mean, <coughs> I don't understand why it's only one, because 10 hours, I mean, in, in, in two days, this term is going to be very small compared with the other one, right? With the home uh, uh, diffusion process. But why you are not able to capture this trend in the, in the, long, uh, in the long run? 
I mean, when you only when you forget about the collagen term, right? This is the I don't know the OU process. They are, this is for the I mean, with these tiny scales, it's really taking into account the process that takes hundreds of days, right? Mm -hmm. So the fitting of uh, of, uh, of that process should correspond to precisely what you see, not for the for the short term, but for the long term, it's important, right? That's what I would expect. Say that last part again. So the OU process, you only have one tiny step that corresponds to the home. Yeah, the transition from yeah. diffusion, regular diffusion. To the process. more complete the model, you have two tiny scales. Yes. One is the home and the other is the foraging. But the foraging, the tiny scale is so short that in, in 10 days, the contribution of that learn should be much smaller than the contribution for the home process. Yeah, but don't, for, don't forget this is in terms of, this is in terms of time lag, not absolute time, so it's, it's it happening Yeah, over exactly, over for over for hand, hand, uh, 100 days, right. this is a, a, well, you, you start from somewhere, and then you take 100 days after. So the term <coughs> that is coming from the from the whole process should be more important than the other one. Important in what sense? Well, yeah. because it's an exponential time, different enough time, divided by the typical characteristic time. So 100 days is much bigger than 10 hours. So the contribution of that is basically much smaller that the contribution from the from the EX process. Exponential. Yeah, I mean I, I think I mean okay, so backing up to the ecology, you wanna know I mean we know that animals are doing things on different time scales and we wanna be able to characterize what that is. So I mean if you were only interested in at the the biggest time scale, you can probably forget all this other stuff and just say how long do we need to observe them until it saturates and they... Well, then I understand that my, my, my technical question is why when you fit only with the scale of, of the OU, it doesn't fit at all. Yeah, if because... It yeah, yeah, wrong, yeah, yeah, okay. No, I, I, I it's, it's, it's a statistical thing. Because uh, because the, the methods for fitting uh, weight, the weight each point in the variogram uh, with the, the inverse of the error to it. So, so out it. here at big lags you have huge error and those points end up getting little weight because you don't have much statistical confidence in them. But in here where you have lots of points you get very good estimates that have small lags those points get a lot of weight and the OU process ends up trying to fit that initial linear diffusion part to this this stuff near the origin and when it does that it cannot it can account for the rest of the that's the, that's the reason. Is that the only one that is also for the cures, the human that fit finally will saturate, the fit will saturate, but yeah. not at the right yeah. level. Yeah, finally, exactly. This home range should appear in the different well, well, yeah. yeah, it's, 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 it's in the usual way, I mean, it should be on top. Right. And, the, and also by the by the equation, you have an exponential analysis, so you just wait with the same amount for its, uh, its point, right. then it should, the fit should be perfectly for. 150, but it's true that if you are just putting because you take into account the precision and the statistical right. error, yes. then it's, it's the fitting is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's that, that's the issue there. So this uh, this OUF model was the, the simplest, most parsimonious model we could, we could found, find that accounted for all uh, all the features in the data, all the important features in the very ground. Yeah. Uh, I don't understand what does the, the home range mean in the Gazil? because you have shown the moving which they move uh, hundreds of kilometers. Yeah. Uh, I see this the saturation is smaller than this. Is that yeah, this that's or? yeah. Well, the no, no it's kilometers squared. Uh, it it's um it's it's proportional to the home range size. So it's like if you if the, the, the home range under this under this in this statistical formalism, the home range ends up being Gaussian. And uh, the the variance of the home range of the probability distribution that describes the Gaussian is sigma h. Mm -hmm. So bigger sigma h implies bigger home range. I'll show you the actual actually right now. Uh, if you just do this simple calculation, you get an average home range estimate of roughly eighty five thousand kilometers squared for the typical gazelle in our sample, which is roughly the size of Ireland. You guys move over huge areas, and that. And you know this is a this is an asymptotic thing. The, the long the longest time series we have is about two years. Um, it seems like you know with this estimate of tau h on the order of sixty days that that's reasonable to characterize their space use. 
It could be though that if you know these guys live ten or more years, you know, at some later time they just jump to a totally different part of Mongolia. You know, the process looks different. But based on the data we have, we can say that they they occupy absolutely huge areas. And for a, you know for a grazing animal like this, I think these are the biggest home range areas that have ever been recorded in these species. So, uh, I'll talk more about what that means in a few minutes. But does that is that okay with the? And I I would say. Um, you know, the, the sort of cheap, easy way to do this uh, would have been to, uh, was actually the first thing we tried, would have been to compute the periodogram, but get rid of the irregularity in the data by coarsening it. Just knock out samples until you have regularly spaced data, and that works. And you can, you can fit these models, uh, you know, that way via the periodogram, and we wouldn't have gotten beyond the OU process. We would have concluded that the OU process is a good model for the data because we would have knocked out all the fine scale stuff that allowed us to see this. So that would have been the end. Doing the statistics right uh, makes a difference. And as far as we know, um, this, uh, this OUF model is new in the literature. Um, Chris couldn't find it anywhere in physics. It's certainly not anywhere in ecology. Um, and we think this might be a pretty, pretty general uh, model of animal motion. And we're going to test that out with many more examples in the next year or so. I guess there's some turbulence with this something like this. Hmm? I'm sure what there's some turbulence. If you know of it, please, please pass it along. Um, okay. The difference between intermittent search processes? Hmm? You know intermittent search processes? Well, this is, uh, this is a kind of intermittent process where you have these different kinds of movement kind of interspersed with each other. We're not at the point yet where we can say, you know, in this particular place, at this particular time, the animal was using the, the, the ballistic part of the motion. But we're, we have the sort of chain of methods in place that we haven't fully worked through yet that will get us there. So it's, it's going there. And I just want to mention really quick, I'm not going to talk much about it, but uh, if you remember that table of the trade-offs between the different estimators, maximum likelihood conditioning on the probability distribution of the process is by far the best and most accurate. To get the variogram to work, we had to average over individuals, well, average over 36 individuals, even for the longest time series. The uh, uh, the single animal variogram was terrible. Couldn't pull anything out of it. But with maximum likelihood, we can do an individual level analysis and fit these models to the time series for each individual. And you, and you find when you do that that there's huge variability in those time scales. This is the foraging time scale. This is the reciprocal of the home range time scale. Um, the points are the individual estimates, and the shaded regions are 95% confidence regions around those. And you can see there's just enormous variability in those scales. Uh, the way these are set up, when the, home ra or when the foraging time scale goes to zero, you recover the OU process, so that's along this axis at uh, tau f equals zero. Um, when the home range size goes to infinity, the home range rate goes to zero, so you, reco you recover a process with initial uh, super diffusion that changes to regular diffusion, just uh, linear semivariance after that. Um, and then the origin uh, then corresponds to classical Brownian motion. So we had a few animals that, accounting for the error and the estimates, were consistent with uh, OU motion. Most were consistent with OUF, and none, it's hard to see here, but none were consistent with uh, this uh, uh, a linear increase in the semi-variance that never saturates, which makes sense for animals that have to run into a barrier sooner or later. And then you can see here, this is the home range area estimates and the uh, foraging area estimates calculated from the corresponding uh, length scales uh, of foraging and, and home range. You can see that these, these are just absolutely enormous areas for most animals, but a few occupy much smaller uh, home ranges. So um, given that, we, you know, what, why are these things so variable? Why is there such huge variability among these? Are some individuals just really fond of roaming around? I doubt it. Um, these animals were attracted at different times and different places. They probably experienced different environments, and some probably just had to go a long way to find food. We're working on a, a new set of analyses now that tries to match up the characteristic length scales of movement for each individual, the corresponding length scales that we see in the vegetation data recovered from uh, satellite imagery. See if there's a correspondence between how they're moving and what the, uh, the landscape that they're moving through looks like. But that's not done yet. Okay, 
You can use these models then to calculate like a, a joint utilization area. This is the probability distribution. The, the contours here the, represent the 95% contours of the distribution of usage time. So within this area, individuals in our sample spent 95% of their time, and outside just the 5%. Um, this gives you an idea of the habitat requirements. Now, this is, remember, this is 36 animals. If you look at the map here, you see the rough outline of Mongolia. This is the eastern steppe. 36 animals are using, essentially, the entire eastern steppe of Mongolia. Um, and don't forget, there's estimated to be more than a million of those guys out there. So developers who are currently extracting all kinds of minerals from the eastern steppe, there's gold, there's oil, there's copper, there's all kinds of stuff. Um, want to know how much, uh, how much uh, cutting up of that habitat can we do? They're building railroads and fences on both sides, they're putting in roads. All these things act as barriers to gazelle movement. And the answer is probably not much. Um, probably all it will take once you put those kind of barriers that cut up this area in is one bad year when uh, grass is really far and few in between and animals would have to move really far to find what they need to have a massive die off. Gazelles. So there's a lot of very urgent conservation biology on the ground work trying to affect the course uh, of development in Mongolia based on the outcomes of this uh, research and what we know about the space <coughs> requirements of gazelles. Okay, so I'm going to end that here. Uh, so we can say now that we think the gazelle have three distinct movement behaviors. They have the small scale super diffusion, which we think corresponds to periods of foraging. Intermediate scale browning motion, which we think corresponds to searching through the environment for patches of resources that they can then forage in, and uh, large scale asymptotic diffusion that's some kind of home ranging behavior. They sort of slow down, their expansion slows down as they get farther and farther out. But huge variability in movement among individuals in the characteristic scales of these movements, um, and even in some in the process. Some individuals were more uh, consistent with the OU than the OUF. On average, the OUF process is like a better model for the animals, and uh, you know, figuring out why uh, why that variability exists is a is a challenge now. And this is this is the point that I if you if you take a home one thing from this talk, I, I want it to be this that statistics matters. Doing this the right way statistically, and paying attention to the connection between the models and the data makes a huge difference when you have data like this. If we had done the cheap and easy thing, we would have missed a big part of the movement behavior, and we would have learned nothing new from all the effort that went into studying these guys. Getting the statistics right and getting the modeling right together is what it takes to do this correctly and to learn new things from these kind of data sets. Um, and as I said before, the, the, the next thing on the agenda is try to link up the characteristic scales of the movements we see for each individual together with the characteristic scales of the habitat dynamics that that individual actually experienced as it moved. So that's work in progress right now. So that's the, the end of the talk. I have a couple more slides kind of summarizing my uh, observations about working with physicists. I don't know if we want to talk more. About, Five minutes. Yeah, I can do it quick. All right. The motor, you guys know the comic XKCD? The web comic XKCD? It's sort of math, physics kind of humor. You haven't seen this? It's great. <laughs> so I, I'm going to motivate this with a little bit of humor. Please take this with a grain of salt. I think this is uh, often how ecologists think about physicists. So go ahead and read that. I love this. So why does your field need a whole journal anyway? <laughs> and then there, there's this. You need some help with the math, let me know, but that should be enough to get you started. Huh? No, I don't need to read your thesis. I can imagine roughly what it says. <laughs> and it's the, this part that kind of got me. My, my impression with uh, working with some of you guys and other physicists over the last few years is that you're, 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 very, you're very focused on and very good with the theoretical side, working out with the models, analyzing the models, understanding their behavior. The data side and connecting it to reality is, yeah, you know, close enough. <laughs> and I, I think I think I, I have some some idea why that might be, but but for, I'll get there in a second. But if I had to give physicists who want to work in ecology and who want to make a contribution to ecology one piece of advice, I thought about what would that what would that be, and how could I say that most parsimoniously? It would be <laughs> learn statistics. 
Uh, oftentimes, in my experience, you guys have fantastic math skills. You know all the math you would need to to do this right, yet you use the cheapest, easiest, quickest, dirtiest way of doing the statistics, and then, you know, that's it. Move on to the next thing. But seriously, learn statistics for real. It, it's well within your reach, and it makes a big difference. Okay, why? Well, again, from the perspective of an, eco of an ecologist, Physicists working outside of physics and other, other disciplines, my experiences with ecology, seem to me to be very often in love with their models to the point where, you know, we did a rough check and that's close enough. Of course that's got to be happening. Maybe, maybe not. If you look at the, ecology has a theoretical side. There are tons of mathematicians and physicists that work there, or mathematically trained ecologists. There are piles upon piles of very clever models with very nice mathematics. Um, but very few of them make the leap to data. And, and oftentimes they're written in ways that are very hard to connect to data. So they're, 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 they're uh, parameterized in, in terms of quantities that you can't very easily observe from data. And so there's this kind of divide between, between those models and what field ecologists are doing. How much you learn from those mathematical exercises in isolation, I don't know. Maybe you get interesting ideas that you can later apply. Maybe you find useful pieces of mathematics that can be repurposed for something else. But how much you learn directly from them is, is an open question. Okay, here is the key point. Data sets in ecology are awful. As a rule, they're terrible. Okay, we do the best we can, but there are a lot of constraints, and it's hard to get nice data. So very often you have these small, noisy, ugly, messy data sets that you have to make the best of. Once you're in that ugly data regime, using the cheap and easy statistical methods is usually not a good idea. So Doing the stats correctly, getting it right, and using methods that get the most out of the data makes a difference. Oftentimes, it's a difference between success and failure. In our case, we learned something fundamentally new about the gazelles. And we're able to develop a new model that captured that only because we did the statistics right. If we had done the cheap and easy thing, we wouldn't have figured anything new out. OK, <clears throat> so I would characterize it like this. Let's say you have a continuum, ecology on one end and physics on the other. In ecology, you get these small, ugly, awful little data sets that you gotta kinda do the best you can with. Now my cartoon understanding of physics is that when theoretical physicists work with data, they're often working with large, pretty, clean, nice data sets. We've had, this little and I have had this discussion in the past. And I think if you're over here, and just for the sake of discussion, let's say there's some bad data threshold. Of course, this really doesn't exist, but when you come over to ecology, you've almost certainly crossed that. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't nasty data sets in physics, and I'm not saying that there aren't nice data sets in ecology, just as a general tendency. Uh, now, once you've crossed the bad data threshold, cheap and easy methods fail um, in the best case scenario. They just break down and you don't get anything. In the worst case scenario, they give you a nice looking result that actually is completely wrong. And this, this happens all the time. You get these spurious results where it's like, oh yeah, look at that and you find out, oh, actually, that's nonsense. That didn't work at all. On this side, when you have nice data, cheap and easy methods are often asymptotically correct. As long as you have enough data, they work fine. So why bother? Small data methods uh, are harder to implement. They're harder to understand. They take much more effort and time to get right. So if you're closer to this extreme where you have nice data, not worth the effort. And my, my impression is physics come Physicists come over to ecology with that kind of mentality in mind, that it's not worth the effort, this is close enough, it's good enough, don't worry about it. But the thing to keep in mind is that you've almost certainly crossed that threshold and now you're dealing with awful data where it in fact does matter and uh, makes all the difference. So, you know, especially to you guys, I know, you know, Cristobal, I'm never going to convince. I've been trying for years. <laughs> he's, he's stuck in his ways. But to you guys who are students and postdocs, if you want to if you want to work in ecology, and I would guess this is true about other disciplines outside of physics, and you want to make an impact on that science and not just write papers for other physicists, paying attention to the data side of it, paying attention to the statistics side of it, I think is a pretty important thing. And I think. You know, mathematically, you have you already are pre-skilled. You have all the it's just probability theory. It just comes down to a lot of probability theory. You already know that. Um, ecologists also do statistics badly, but for a completely different reason. Ecologists appreciate the importance of statistics and the necessity of statistics, but they don't know the math to do it right. So they learn a couple of tools, and they have a hammer then, and every problem starts to look like a nail. 
and they start to just kind of shoehorn their problems into this couple little boxes they know. So anyway, I think you guys are in a position to, to do this well and to do this right. It just takes more awareness of, the, of, of that issue. So I'll leave it there, and uh, thank you for your attention.
And uh, my colleague, Kirk Olson, who's a gazelle guy, spent 12 years living in Mongolia working in the field. Um, he made some observations a couple of years ago where it was one of the worst years on record. It was a drought. There was only grass, you, you know, edible grass in a couple places in the whole steppe. And in one of those places, he came over a hill and he found uh, what he estimated to be over a quarter of a million gazelles that all congregated there. They came from all over Mongolia to end up in this one place. In years like that, if you cut up the step into little pieces, where are you going to go? If you don't happen to luck out and be right next to where the one or two places that have food are, you starve. So that's the, that's the concern. But then for the company to build you know, under the yeah, I mean, we talk about ideas like that, but you know, building a building a pass an underpass is under a thousand kilometers of railroad. Uh, you know, what you can put them every kilometer. You know, how much does it cost to put each one in there? Does the, the company certainly is going to try not to have to spend that money? <laughs> you know, it, it, there there are you know solutions like that that on a small scale are practical, but on a big scale. Who's going to pay for it? And I, I think a, a, a weird historical artifact, um, when they built railways in Mongolia, they followed these old Soviet practices of putting fences on both sides of the railway for the entire length of it. So it turns it into this impenetrable barrier. But the fences are there to keep the cattle off the tracks. And there are large expanses of the eastern steppe that have no cattle. So why not take the fences down? That would be easier. But they won't do it. So. <laughs> No, thank you again. Yes. What data you record and transmit? Is that uh, science fiction or? No, no, no. People are working on things like that. Um, there are collars that have accelerometers on them, and uh, you know, some that measure like the animal's heart rate, and some that sometimes they even like couple the collar with like a temperature sensor in the stomach. So you know, like all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, but people have just, uh, the ecologists have just started thinking about what you can actually do with that. And again, the, you know, if you if you had a set of statistical methods yeah, you know, to give you data like that, then you could use it. Yeah, of course, you still need to apply all the statistical right. methods that yeah. you mentioned because yeah. the, the data will be even more yeah. than right. than now. Because yeah, but there's all, all kinds of stuff happening with the technology that, that will go in that direction. Well, because, uh, that, that's the more way to adjust what you measure to what you Right now, the market for these kinds of devices is very small. So the companies that make these things are like you know, two people in a basement and they have an electronic store. Yeah, it's basically custom made, custom made, and the cost of function. And the more things you put into the college, the higher the failure rate. Oh, yeah. So I think usually the main expense in doing this is getting out to the field and catching the animals and putting the college out. So we call this. Yeah, 
talk to a satellite. Yeah, no, that's 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 and you could probably reposition them. And there are, there are some uh, uh, in the parts of the world where you have one cell phone network coverage, you can use these really small devices that just send cell phone towers. Um, but in, you know, in Mongolia, there's no cell phone tower within a thousand kilometers. But all kinds of little stuff. It's yeah, 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 very yeah, fast yeah. right now. Yeah. 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 We program in a random way, so that's the way to do it, but yeah, yeah, yeah. if you could adjust yeah. to the... Yeah. To the we're, we're actually um, we're discussing with some uh, folks in the aerospace industry a design for uh, animal colors that would allow the colors to program the colors to change remotely from a satellite. So that would be, you know, if you notice something that was happening in real time, you could have done that. If you communicate with your colors, it would be possible, right? You see something interesting happening, and you could tailor the program Sorry, just just before uh, we were discussing now, uh, it's a different uh, some absolutely different of this, the vegetation part. We decided yesterday to include the diffusion or not. <laughs> We decided to make the discrete simulation, to include the discrete simulation in the paper, and then, of course, to be coherent to put the diffusion there in the microscopic oh, yeah. yeah. small diffusion. It's not a small diffusion term, and I think you can say, you can do like a little side analysis that says as long as it's you know on the order of blah, 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 smaller than, it doesn't really matter. And then but we can always include it, and then we can, because we are going to, the, the question is, we are going to include a figure of the discrete simulation. That would be yeah. Yeah, yeah. So then, for coherence, maybe we can. But I, I think, yeah, I mean, I, I think it goes with the theme of trying to get to the simplest possible representation. Of yeah, but this is not a real complication of the model. Yeah, yeah you can say because everybody yeah. always puts the diffusion yeah. term for continuity with the discrete process we included, but really it doesn't matter. So we drop it in the analysis. Okay, so see you later. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you that this is important. <laughs> but I also, my problem is uh, when I work with solid biologists, and it's difficult to find, so because one has to do it, as we did with this, this postdoc, uh, the available statistical methods have so many assumptions that, oh, yeah, yeah. that yeah. Is, it's, be, it's better to use the, the dirty and <laughs> the simplest. But, but, uh, yeah, but yeah, I agree with you that one should do the things properly. Yeah, you, know, <laughs> you essentially have to build them from the you know, from probabilities. Adapt, adapted to the to what the first time. Problem. Yeah, which takes time. <laughs> Okay, hey, we go for lunch together, but I, I would like, maybe we can go also, or we can take a sandwich here. Maybe it's a bit just in the Yeah, yeah, yeah. For you it's okay, no? Yeah. So we meet in, yeah. uh, how many minutes, Roy? What? Yeah. In 15 minutes? Yeah, that's okay. I'm going to tell the dishes that we have here. Okay. Do I need to bring them back any of this stuff? Or? Yeah, that's what I'm going to. I'm going to tell them that I finish here. Thank you.